You know, the Bible is not a book about perfect people. We often think that. I mean, we often look at the Bible heroes, and, and, and we, there's so many amazing characters in the Bible and amazing people in the Bible. But really, if you study the Bible, you find out that all those folks had flaws. They were not perfect people. So the Bible is not a story about perfect people. It's a story about a perfect God who used imperfect people. And so I'm preaching a sermon series called Unlikely Heroes. Because we find a lot of heroes in the Bible, but they were unlikely. They were not maybe who you would expect. You know, when we see someone doing a heroic act that's, that's great and has all the resume, we think, yeah, well, okay, we expected that. But when you see someone who's unlikely... It really causes us to ask another question. How did they do that? What's happening here? And it leads us biblically to the God behind the scenes. The God who is answering prayer. Amen? So today we're going to look at the life of Ehud in the Bible. In the book of Judges. And see how he was an unlikely hero. And you know what? Maybe you're the unlikely hero who God wants to use to carry his glory to others. Okay, I'll talk to you after the sermon. Open your Bibles to the book of Judges chapter 3. Book of Judges chapter 3. And in the month of August, I'm going to preach from the book of Judges. And I've never done this before. I'm going to take the life of four different judges and preach on them. I'm titling this whole series, Unlikely Heroes. Because some of these folks seem to be unlikely to me once we dig into their lives. So we have... Ehud, Deborah, Gideon, and Samson. Now maybe we're most familiar with the life of Samson probably, and he, he takes the most space in the stories in the book of Judges. But this morning I want to look at the life of Ehud, or we could call him Ehud, or if we were Hebrew we'd say Ehud. Do y'all want to practice that this morning? Okay, so I'm just going to say Ehud. So let's turn to Judges chapter 3 and read the life of Ehud. Verse 12 of Judges 3. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. The story of Judges is picking up historically from the conquest of the land of, of, of Canaan with Joshua unto the end of Judges, and the last verse in the book of Judges ends like this. There was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So we're left in a terrible state at the end of Judges, but it opens the door for the kings to come. And so after this period, historically, we see King Saul, we see King David, King Solomon. It opens the way for the kings. And so Judges really was an experiment in theocracy because the way God wanted Israel to operate was as a theocracy. That is, God would be the king. God would bless the people. God would protect the people as long as they did their part, which was to worship the Lord and to obey His commandments. But we see over and over in the book of Judges, the people failed. Over and over, they did what we just read. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. And then when they would backslide then God would allow a foreign power to come and take them over. That's exactly what's happening here. 
They've backslid, they failed God, and so God is allowing the Moabite king Eglon to come and take them captive. That's where we find ourselves in Judges chapter 3. This becomes a cyclical pattern over and over and over in the Judges. And each time the people would get in that predicament, they would eventually start praying again and start crying out to God again and asking for deliverance. And then God would raise up a deliverer. In English, it comes across as judges. God would raise up a judge. But the Hebrew term has more of a sense of a deliverer. God would raise up a deliverer to set the people free. And so what struck me is how God used common people to do His will. How many common folk do we have out there today? Okay, about half of y'all. The rest of you are uncommon, I guess, which isn't bad either, but <laughs> as someone says, you're unique, you're special, just like everyone else on planet Earth. <laughs> okay, anyhow. So let's read the rest of this. Judges chapter 3, verse 13. Then he gathered himself to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek and went and defeated Israel and took possession of the city of Palms. This is Eglon, the king of the Moabites. The city of Palms was the city of Jericho. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, here we go, they're crying out. When they cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. By him the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. So when the people cried out, God raised up for them this man Ehud. And all we know about him is that he was a Benjamite, he was left-handed, and the people chose him to take tribute or gifts to Eglon. Because in the ancient world, when a foreign power would conquer a certain area, that foreign power would often demand payment, tribute to be brought back. You see that all through the Bible. And this is the same thing that's happening with Eglon the Moabite. He demands a tribute, so the Israelites send Ehud. So evidently he had to be somebody that the people trusted. He had to be someone maybe of renown. Maybe he was a powerful warrior, the reason they sent him to take tribute. But I want to look at it this morning in, in this way. God can use any of us to do amazing things. God can use any one of you to do His will. Matter of fact, that is His will. That each of us would be available and willing to do what God calls us to do. Amen? Amen? I heard a story one time that a person visited a town that great leaders had come from. And they pulled up in the town square and there were men sitting on a park bench. And the person said, is this the town where all the great leaders were born? And an old man responded and said, no, only babies were born here. <laughs> only babies born here. Any of us can be used mightily of God. You should hear Dima's story. His testimony of where God brought him from and how God is using him to minister in the Ukraine. You should hear my story sometime. <laughs> I tell it a lot. I was like an unlikely candidate, I think, for God to use in a lot of ways. Maybe you're the same way. Maybe you just feel totally like, I can't, how can God ever use me? I don't have the smarts. I don't have the the influence, I don't have the, I'm not spiritual enough, I don't know. Let's, let's put all that aside this morning and just open up the possibility that God can use you to do exactly what He needs to do through you to bless some people. Amen? The first thing I see here is that God uses common people to do His will. If you look in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, mankind fell into sin. In Genesis chapter 6, Mankind was again found in, in, in irreversible sin and God just wiped them out with a flood. 
Then in Genesis chapter 11, here they gather again in the, the plains of Shinar and build a tower unto heaven and it's repulsive to God, and God comes down and confounds their language and judges them again. So, so by Genesis chapter 11, we've had three major judgments on mankind, and it looks like all hope is gone, and God is just going to wipe everyone out. But then we turn the page, and we get to the next chapter, and it says, and the Lord spoke to Abram. When all else failed, when all hope was gone, God called a man. He called a common man to do his will and obey his word. That's what he always does. He calls common men and common women to do his word. Can somebody shout amen? As I mentioned as we were praying this morning, Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit said, Set unto me, set apart for me, Paul and Barnabas, two common men, Two fleshly men that God was going to use to carry his gospel throughout the ancient world. Can somebody shout amen? God still operates this way. He's always operated this way. He just uses people. Look at your neighbor and ask him, are you a people? Then you're a candidate to be used of God. The Bible says that Ehud was a left-handed man. And so as I began researching this, I found a lot of sermons on how God uses you in spite of your weaknesses because being left-handed in the ancient world may have been seen as a disadvantage. But as I continued to study, I don't think that's what's going on here at all. In fact, the Hebrew term here for left-handed has been interpreted as ambidextrous. And it emphasizes the fact that Ehud was a Benjamite. Now later on in Judges chapter 20, it says there were 700 left-handed Benjamites who could use a sling so accurately that they could hit a target within a hair's breadth. It says that. 700 of them. Now were they all left-handed? I don't think so. But the idea was that the Benjamites were so bad to the bone that they would tie the right hand behind their back and learn to fight with the left hand as powerfully as the right hand. So when they went into battle, if one hand got caught up, they could use another one and kill their enemy. Can somebody say Rambo? I'm t- I read this and I'm like, come on, this is R-rated by the way. It is R-rated. So they could. So I think that's what it's getting at. I don't think it was a weakness at all. I think he was so bad to the bone, he could fight you with the right or turn around and fight you with the left. He was that skilled. Ahud, Rambo. <laughs> Let's read what happens to him because this is just phenomenal. So, so let me let me say this. God uses common people, but also. I think God is using his strengths. Okay, we talk about all all through the Bible how God uses us in spite of our weaknesses, and we know that's right, amen? But also, God can take the strengths you have and use them for his glory. And I don't think we preach on this enough. That God is using the strengths this guy has and he's going to use them to accomplish his will. What are you talking about, Pastor Hans? Well, evidently he was a great military leader. Evidently he was a great warrior. God's going to take that ability and use it for his glory. Maybe you are a great business person. When you get saved, it doesn't mean you have to throw that out the window. Maybe God wants to use that business ability in you for the kingdom. Lord knows we need you. Maybe you're a great caring person. You care for people and you have a big heart for people. Well, when you get saved, God maybe wants to use that in your life to care for people maybe a pastoral way or a, or a loving way. Or maybe you're a great teacher in the world. When you come into the church, God can sanctify that gift and use that in your life. Maybe you're a musician and you've played in orchestras or you've played in rock bands or whatever. May come into the church and get that gift sanctified and let God use that for for his kingdom. Let him take your, take your strengths and your abilities and use them for the kingdom. 
I was amazed when I lived in Washington, D.C. for many years at how many godly, I know we talk about Washington, but how many godly, spirit-filled people I met who work in government. Some of them holding prayer meetings, believing God for great things to happen. I heard the uh, Senate chaplain speak one time, and he said, you know, we can talk about the senators if we want to, but I've been in many of their homes, and I've seen a Bible ragged and marked cover to cover on their coffee table. So God has some people using their gifts and their abilities for His kingdom. God has some scientists, thank God. God has some scientists out there working, creating, and developing, using their skills for the kingdom. Let God take what you have and use it for His glory. Okay, now let's read the rest of the story. You parents may have to explain this to your children. I don't know. Verse 15. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ahud the son of Gareb, the Benjamite, a left-handed man, by him, the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab, and now, now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was a double-edged and a cubit in length and fastened it under his clothes in his right thigh. Okay, now he's not only bad to the bone with a slingshot and a fighter, but he can even make his own weapons. And he puts it under his right thigh so he can reach with the left and pull it out. So what happens then? Verse 17, so he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. The king said, keep silence. And all who attended him went out from him. So they're left alone. So Ahud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. Then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. Then Ehud reached with his, right, his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. That was the message from God. Even the hilt went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade. For he did not draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. Then Ahud went out through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. When he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, the doors of the upper chamber were locked. So they said, he's probably attending to his needs or using the bathroom in the cool chamber, so they waited till they were embarrassed, and still he had not opened the doors, of the, and therefore they, they took the key and opened them, and there was the master fallen dead on the floor. I know this is a brutal story, but you got to look at it in an overarching spiritual way. What was God doing? God was answering the prayers of His people in setting His people free from a harsh taskmaster and someone who had taken them captive. God was setting His people free. He was getting His work done, and God was using a common person to carry out His will. God uses our vessels to carry out His will and to carry His power and glory. So Ehud was the answer to the children of Israel's prayer. You might be the answer to someone's prayer today. You might be the answer that someone needs if you just make yourself available and say, God, here I am, send me, let me do your will. So Ahud comes and he uses his shrewdness to make his way into a private setting with this king. And then he knew he had a double-edged sword or double-edged knife strapped to his thigh. He knew he could fight with either hand. And he knew that his life was on the line, but he didn't care. He got that king alone. He knew how the lock systems worked. And he, he stabbed him in the stomach. The blade sunk in because the man was so big. He locked every door behind him and made his way out. And what did he do? Did he go run for his life? No. The Bible says he went and blew the ram's horn. 
He went and blew the ram's horn and gathered the Israelites together to him. And then once the Midianites eventually found out what happened, they came out, the Bible said, with strong, well-bought or well-abled men. And Ehud and his guys wiped them out. Why? Because God was with them and they knew how to fight. Can somebody shout amen? So God uses people to carry out his purposes. God uses us to carry his glory. God uses us to carry his message. God uses us to carry his word. Why? I don't know. It's just the way God set it up. God could have just said, forget all preachers. I've had enough problems out of preachers. I'm just going to send angels to do my work. Or God could have said, just forget about church members. I've had enough infighting and backbiting and church splits, denominational fights. I'm just going to send all the heavenly hosts to do my work. But no, he hasn't done it that way. He says, I'm still going to use people. I'm going to use preachers who are fallible. I'm going to use church members who are fallible. I'm going to use common vessels to carry out my glory. Can somebody shout amen? Amen. And it's puzzling why God does that. As our, you, you know, you can read the story of many great people in church history, and you can find that a lot of them had a lot of flaws. Even read about some of the great faith healers of the 20th century. There's a book written by Robert Slyardin called God's Generals. And if you read through that, you'll read the life of a lot of these men and women of God. And some of them had really sketchy endings to their life or sketchy backgrounds. And, but God used them for His glory. Some say arguably the greatest faith healer of the 20th century was Catherine Kuhlman. I love to listen to her still today. But Catherine Kuhlman said it one time. She said, I was God's fourth choice. I was God's fourth choice. I love her humility. I was God's fourth choice. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses is up on the mountain and he's tending the flocks. And while he's up on the mountain, all of a sudden he sees a bush burning and it's not consumed. And he stops and he looks at the bush and then the voice of God speaks out of the bush to him. And God starts to tell him, hey, I have a work for you to do. I want you to go back to Egypt where you fled from as they were seeking your life. The place you might have forgotten about 40 years ago. I want you to go back to that place and I want you to deliver the message to the king. And I want you to tell him, hey king, let my people go. And Moses hears this and he's like, say what? (laughs) He starts asking all these questions. He's like, I can't do that. You know, I can't speak plain, Lord. I'm not your guy. Don't worry about it. Your brother's already on the way. He'll speak for you. But but, but Lord, when I show up, what am I going to say? Well, take the rod in your hand and cast it down. It becomes a serpent. He picks it up. It becomes a rod again. Put your hand into your bosom. He puts his hand into his clothing, pulls it out, and it becomes like leprous. Then he puts it back in, and it becomes clean again. God says, this is the kind of signs and wonders I'm going to do through you if you'll just go. And God gives him the commission kind of like this. He says, Moses, I've heard the cries of my people, and I see their oppression, and I am coming down to set them free. That's what God says. I've seen my people. I've heard their cries. I see their oppression. And I'm coming down. So, you know, if you would think through that, Moses could have been like, help yourself, God. Go right ahead. (laughs) But right after that, he says, now you go for me. Notice how powerful. God, God is coming down, but he still needs a man or a woman to go for him and do his bidding, be the vessel that he chooses. The Bible says the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They cried out because they were under oppression. They were under the oppression of a foreign king. And the Bible says they cried out to the Lord and the Lord sent Ehud. The answer to the Israelites' prayer was a man. A man who stepped up And did what he had to do to bring deliverance to the Israelite nation. Well, let's look at it in a spiritual way. Maybe you're the answer to someone's prayer. Maybe someone needs 
the encouraging word you have. Maybe someone needs them to pray with them and you're the person to go pray for them. Maybe you are the unlikely hero. All that takes is saying, Lord, I'm available. What do you want me to do, God? Here I am. Send me and use me to carry your glory. As I said in the sermon, God uses common people like you and I. It's the way he set this whole thing up. He uses common people like you and I to carry his glory. Men and women, even children, elderly people, whoever. God uses whoever he wants to to carry his glory. Listen, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, now is the time to do that. Now's the time to step up and say, God, here I am. Use me. Take my life. Make it into something great. Maybe you're struggling with guilt and you're struggling with the sins and the things that, that you've been involved in or maybe the addictions you've been involved in. You're carrying those and there are weights on your shoulders. Well, I want to encourage you today to pray with me and release it all. The Bible says, cast your cares on the Lord for he cares for you. Cast your cares. Take all of that weight and all of the guilt and cast it on the Lord today because he's well able to handle it. All you have to do is open up your heart and ask him in. It's very simple. We're going to pray a simple prayer. If you want to ask Christ into your heart, pray it with me. Lord Jesus, forgive me of all sin and come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. And now just give him thanks. Give him thanks that you made that step of faith. Give him thanks that now you've opened the doors of your heart and allowed him in. I want to do one more thing. I know there's people watching us all over the world. And I want to pray for healing right now for you. A lot of you out there are struggling with sickness and disease. And I believe God still heals. He's never stopped being a healer. He healed in the Bible. He heals today. We've seen many miracles and many testimonies have been given to us through the crusades and TV ministry we've been doing around the world. So if you need healing, why don't you just pray with me right now. Extend your faith. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask for healing right now for all the folks watching. That you would heal their bodies, heal their minds, heal their spirits right now in the name of Jesus. As they extend their faith, God, you extend your miracle working power. And we give you thanks for it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You can say amen where you are. Hallelujah. Listen, I'd love to hear from you if God's done a miracle in your life. If you've accepted Christ into your heart, I'd love to hear from you. All my information is below. We'll be praying for you. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Look straight ahead, my face towards the sun.